Immortals of Avium is the first third-party Unreal Engine 5 release to come out on PC and console targeting the usage of nearly all the premier headline features that the engine has to offer. Lumen Ray Tracing for real-time global illumination and reflections. Nanite for high-quality geometry and seamless level of detail. Virtual Shadow Maps for a near ray trace like quality to all of the game's shadows. And Niagara Particles, which bring greater artist control for game effects. In today's video brought to you by Digital Foundry and Immortals of Avium, I want to bring you, the viewer, step by step through each of these techniques and show you how they are leveraged in Immortals of Avium to make this next generation magical first person shooter shine the brightest. So pull up a chair, invoke a spell, and let's talk about how Unreal Engine 5 is powering the graphics of Immortals of Avium. Immortals of Avium is first and foremost a magical first person shooter. You shoot off spells, you avoid enemy attacks, and you traverse the environment in between combats to find power-ups and items. The common thread throughout all of this gameplay is actually color. Mortals of Avium makes liberal usage of primary colors to emphasize the different magical types in the game, advertised item locations, and to help you kind of classify enemies in combat. In this manner, the game is a bit of a throwback to shooters of old, which had color and silhouettes driving the core gameplay readability there. Being a modern title powered by UE5 though, Immortals of Avium can up the ante so to speak, and it goes crazy with particles to underscore those colorful gameplay elements and also spice up the game's atmosphere. Here is where Unreal Engine 5's Niagara Particles come into play, and quite literally coming into play as they are usually the most noticeable UE5 element, so to speak, when you're in that moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, when you're in combat, and when you're moving at full speed. A burst of particles here? Well, perhaps I should shoot that thing. A wisp of color here? Well, perhaps I should go over there to investigate. In combat, it almost goes without saying as to what these primarily GPU-driven particles from Niagara add to the game. Each shot of your powers will send off a stream of particles toward the enemy, exploding on contact usually and producing another bunch of particle sparks in the process that will fly through the air and often bounce around the environment. For certain magical types like the red fireish magic, Downing an enemy will reward you with an explosion that leaves an after image of embers in the shape of the enemy that you just vaporized. Outside of combat and that quick identification of items and power-ups that I talked about earlier, the usage of Niagara Particles is primarily for atmosphere building. This is a magical world here in Avium, and there's a blend of medieval aesthetics with an almost techno-futuristic energy there where artifacts are swelling with the power imbued in them. Still, the usage is varied, I would say. Sometimes the particle effects are used to emphasize otherworldliness, like here where you can see geometry particles are intermixed with wispy point cloud looking ones to give the appearance of the world being unstable and almost being erased right before your eyes. At other times it's fanciful, where you see vector fields being used to show animations of turbulence, where particles flow over one another in a twisting turning pattern in three dimensions. Niagara particles in this game are perhaps the flashiest UE5 thing that you can see, and it's one that I think most players will notice on just even a cursory glance, given the intense fireworks show that the game can sometimes look like, especially in combat. But in terms of building the overall aesthetic, I would say other UE5 features are more important, but they're a bit more subtle as they come to your attention in those moments when you would stop, slow down, and admire the game's scenery. When you take the time to do that, that is when you would first and foremost notice the broad strokes, the differences in color and tone across the entire image, the way shadows are emphasized in crevices, and the brightest surfaces pick up light from neighboring ones. Really, when you slow down to take in the environment, that is when you start to notice the impact that Lumen has 
on this game's visuals. Lumen is Epic's take on real-time global illumination and reflections achieved via ray tracing, like we've seen championed in other games such as Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition. In Ascendance Immortals of Avium, they opted to use the software ray tracing version of Lumen, which on console platforms trades accuracy for computational speed and a wider hardware support. It's much easier to hit 60 FPS on consoles with software Lumen than it is hardware Lumen, and given how this game is targeting 60 FPS there, well, it makes sense. When talking with the developers, the advantages for them in opting to use Lumen are obvious. They have quicker iteration times where they can change the environment and not spend egregious amounts of time waiting for static lighting to calculate. It also means less of a headache in managing the memory load for all static light maps. From the developer perspective, real-time ray trace lighting is a paradigm switch which has many benefits. From the outward-facing player perspective though, real-time lighting from ray tracing is usually about what it brings to visual fidelity and the dynamism in game worlds. That is not always obvious though. With real-time ray trace global illumination and reflections as seen here in Immortals of Avium, it does a lot of things right in the lighting as a byproduct of how it works, making the game's scenes more cohesive as a whole. But it won't be incredibly obvious as it's not announcing itself to you in big bold letters. The game will just look right, so you might just walk on by without much of a thought. The reason for this is how Lumen and ray tracing in general tends to prevent typical issues we see in video game lighting, such as light glow. Not to pick on other games of course, but the way lighting is done without ray tracing, for example in those Unreal Engine 4 games with static light maps, means that many objects that reflect or move dynamically do not mesh well with static lighting. So such objects tend to have this weird glow to them that just doesn't make any sense. Shadowed regions will have this grayish, whitish, bluish sheen to them. This light glow issue definitely gets in the way of games looking their best, and it's just an inherent thing that happens when static lighting is used most of the time. In Immortals of Avium, you'll be hard pressed to find such odd glowy lighting like you might find in an Unreal Engine 4 game. Lumen's ray traced indirect lighting and reflections here are working in real time to prevent that typical video game look. Beyond the issues it prevents, Lumen brings a lot of additive fidelity to the table as well. Take a scene like this one here for example. Most of this cliff face is out of reach of direct sunlight, but instead of just being pitch black outside of the sunlight, we can see how the area in shadow is lit by light emitting from the sky. And underneath the outcroppings of rock touched by that skylight, we can see small shadows forming where the skylight is being blocked. These indirect shadows seen here form a bedrock upon which many of Immortals of Avium's scenes are composed, and really only look as detailed and as natural as they do thanks to Lumen. Take here this overcast level, for example. There's no sunlight really whatsoever here. Yet underneath this wooden tower, we can see darkness forming, where there are indirect shadows from the light emitting from the sky, giving the scene a naturalistic look. Without ray tracing, overcast lighting most of the time in video games tends to look very flat. Not the case here. For example, here in this open area, it's rather big and the player can go almost anywhere you see here on screen. Baking out static lighting textures that maintain a high fidelity for this entire area would most likely not be feasible for memory reasons. So if there were static lighting in a scene like this one, it would most likely be under detailed. But if we zoom into this area I highlight over here, we can see that even in this shadowed region, tiny little objects have indirect shadows in those areas where they block sky lighting. So even though this isn't a wide open area, ray tracing's per pixel nature allows it to have dynamic detail when static lighting most likely wouldn't even have the memory to include such detail in the first place. In the end, this enhanced ability to have more convincing indirect shadows thanks to Lumen means that the image in general will look less video gamey. It has less video game lighting errors and it importantly has higher local contrast. Corners away from light can actually get dark as there's little light leaking through by accident into those shadows. Now of course, since it is real-time global illumination and reflections, another thing you can see often in Immortals of Avium here is the effect of light bouncing from one surface to the next. And since it's being done in real time with ray tracing, you can see some ultra fine details in that bounce lighting that texture based static lighting would really struggle to resolve. Take here on this wagon, for example. The sunlight is hitting the wall.
wall to the right, just outside the camera view. It is bouncing off that wall and reflecting onto the wagon, giving it a sunburned hue. This bounce light then forms subtle shadows behind the wheels and underneath the cart where the sunlight cannot reach it. Once again, this is increasing local contrast, which is a positive image quality trait. Such detailed lighting is found throughout the game. It can be really obvious, like you can see here with these arches where the sunlight is bouncing off the ground and lighting up the ceiling, creating detailed shadows in the gaps between the arches, or it can at times be subtle, like how the brown dirt of the ground in this shot here is bouncing a lot of that light off it into the area surrounding it, making most shadow regions in this scene yellow and earth toned. But the big point to get across here is that the entire game is lit via lumen, which is a systemic lighting solution. So it leads to a cohesive image in almost any scene on the macro scale or on the micro scale when you get up real close. As for really obvious reflections like in metal or glass, Immortals of Avium does not have a lot of such materials in the game. The few shinier surfaces you will come across do show off lumen reflections though quite well. Where you can see the screen space reflection element from lumen hiding most of the performance optimizations used to make it work in real time at 60 fps on consoles. Such shiny surfaces though are few and far between as I just mentioned. Most metals you will come across in the game are of a dulled and worn variety, not polished enough to give off really stark and obvious reflections that people tend to associate with the phrase ray tracing. Still, I would say like we can see on the speeder craft here, Lumen will greatly aid in making such dulled metals look true to life. Lumen's design means ray tracing applies to the entire range of material reflectivity. So you don't see usual cube map issues, for example, or obvious light leak in metals like these here, like you might see in other games that lack such real-time global illumination. Coming back to that painting theme again, Lumen is the broad brushstroke that gives the scenes in Immortals of Avium their core look. And with that being said, Nanite then is the fine detail work which layers on top of that and gives the world a texture that holds up even under great scrutiny. Unreal Engine 5's Nanite, I would say, is the most radically different and perhaps revolutionary part of the visual feature set in that engine. The basic idea is that instead of using the GPU's dedicated hardware which renders triangles, it instead uses generic compute shaders. This steps around performance issues when triangles become too small on screen and thus expensive to render, and it also allows for a procedural level of detail system. In practice for most games, this just means better geometric quality. It means that you'll be hard pressed to find visible edges on objects at most view distances in those games that would use Nanite. That is just one of its interesting properties though, but it is one that you will definitely notice when you walk around the world of Immortals of Avium. And if you spend the time to look at objects, they hold up really well. At standard player camera distances, most objects you will find will lack obvious edges in them, being rounded like you would expect, with a lot of the detail being drawn out with real geometry instead of just textures like you would have seen with traditional workflows. One of my favorite examples is this cart here. I find the amount of detail added into it superb thanks to Nanite. You see all those little bells and buckles being drawn with real geometry, and notice how rounded it is. The wheels, the spokes, and the support struts lack any triangle edges. They look perfect. It has more in common with an asset you might see in pre-rendered CGI than you would find in a traditional video game. And that is the general impression you will have of scattered assets in this game. Really rounded edges and a lot of detail that hold up even when you get really close to mundane things like door hinges and whatnot. But the intense detail is just one aspect of Nanite. The ability to dramatically instance that detail is another. Instancing basically means that geometry can be cloned and repeated at its high detail without worrying about overdraw or draw calls slowing things down. That means you can have very dense views with a lot of geometry in it, and Immortals of Avium takes this up a notch versus standard UE5 as it has a custom shader branching system to reduce rendering load, thus allowing for even more unique meshes that otherwise might not be possible with a usual render budget. The end result is you can see a good amount of variation in the objects scattered across a game level, all holding up rather well, 
in the way I mentioned earlier with all that detail. The last aspect of Nanai is the most subtle one, I would say, and that is the lack of visible detail swapping. Now, normally in a game, there are discrete object level of detail variants that are made to reduce visible aliasing or sparkle on screen, as well as make sure that geometric triangles never get too small so that the performance can stay high. The issue is though that you will see these discrete LODs changing in real time as a player, like you can see here, you know, where you can see an object at a distance flip to a higher or lower quality version. It's an aspect of video game graphics that has been around there almost since the dawn of 3D. Nanite though doesn't do this. Nanite doesn't use discrete level of details. It instead changes the level of detail procedurally based upon the camera distance, and it does it by changing tiny bits of the model at a time so that it is mostly visually imperceptible. The result is something like this. Check out this mass of wires, paneling, and trees at a distance here. As I scroll the camera in, I want you to notice how none of the objects that I'm looking at here in this view have visible pop occurring as the camera gets closer. In other games, the discrete level of detail models would either fade or pop in in some obvious manner. Here with Nanite, it is procedurally done on a fine-grained basis. So even as you get really close, the level of detail is changing, but you don't see the obvious switches and the detail holds up. The end result of this is that the world in Immortals of Avium, while scrolling and walking around, shows a great level of stability. It will look whole and intact as you move through it without this pop-in of discrete levels of detail. This behavior applies to all of those game objects that use Nanite, and it results in a stable world view. This aspect of Nanite is actually my favorite part of Nanite, as it is indeed the most subtle, but it's also crucial subconsciously to get a video game out of the uncanny valley, and it working as well as it does in this game is rather neat to see. Nana by itself though, with all its detail, is actually an incomplete product. All that detail up close is meaningless if you cannot see it in relief with the contours and the shading changing depending upon lighting. This is where virtual shadow maps come into play in Immortals of Avium. Basically, all the small detail that is possible on nanite objects needs to have shadows cast from that detail so you can actually see it and the object doesn't look flat. Virtual shadow maps is one way of achieving this, where much like ray traced shadows, the shadows on small bits and small objects stay tight and razor accurate no matter the camera distance, as virtual shadow maps will scale their quality based upon the resolution and the size of a shadow in screen space. The end result is that you'll see small things casting shadows in a very detailed and sharp way, so you can see them reliefed in contrast against themselves and their backgrounds. Virtual shadow maps also avoid an uncanny any look that you can see in high resolution shadows in other games as they show off a variable level of sharpness or penumbra shadows. Shadows will start off hard and sharp and end diffuse and soft depending upon the distance of the shadow from the light and the object casting it. VSM ends up being the glue that holds all the nanite detail together in this game so you can see it well without the usual issues you can see in most normal shadow map implementations. So there you have it, that is how Immortals of Avium uses the core tech features of Unreal Engine 5. Each aspect of particles, lighting, shadows, and geometry play their part to affect the visuals, but they really work best in tandem, which is how Epic designed them in the first place. And when they do, as we see here, it can lead to some very convincing visual results that just really wouldn't be possible on previous generation hardware. And that's really all I have to say about that though. If you did like this video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you wanna help us out, support DF on Patreon to get years of our content in high quality for download. Other than that, comment below, follow on Twitter, and as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell, and auf Wiedersehen!